the conflict within uh, developing countries is very clearly a very major source of misery and underdevelopment. And in fact, if you look at the bottom 10 countries in terms of human development index, nine out of them have had war very recently or are in war at the moment. So it's, it's a devastating thing. And so obviously we are looking to try and find the causes. And there have been many approaches to understanding the causes of conflict. Um, one is simply to blame it on culture, age-old animosities between people, clash of civilizations, as Huntington says. Um, people can't live together peacefully. Now, clearly that's wrong, because in fact, if you count all the people who are living together peacefully, and some people have done that uh, for sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's only 0.01% of them who are in conflict. Uh, another approach has been to say it's all about individual greed. It's another form of your rational economic man. Uh, it's people trying to get, make money to enrich themselves and so on. Um, well, the problem about that is, uh, of course, that there are many situations in which people are trying to enrich them, but themselves and they're not all in conflict. But more seriously, the conflicts we observe are group-based. So we need to look at something. It's something about having a group that is uh, related to conflict, not simply individual greed. So here I'm hypothesizing that it's horizontal inequalities that lie at the root of many conflicts. Now, horizontal inequalities are inequalities among groups. The sort of inequality we often um, talk about when we say a society is unequal is what I would call vertical inequality or inequality among individuals within that society. Here we're talking about groups. And of course, the first question that arises is, which groups? Um, how do we categorize people? There are many ways of categorizing people. Uh, we're talking about groups which are important to those people who are members, salient identities, um, and groups which are important to others, so they label them as such. We're talking about groups which it's not easy to move from, because if you can move from one group to another very readily, your actual group membership doesn't matter. You can be a member of one book club or another book club, and you won't be particularly in mind which one if you can move from one to another. Um, I would want to, uh, right at the beginning, to say that uh, group boundaries are constructed socially. They're socially constructed. They're not something that's innate from the time you're born. They are socially constructed. They are reinforced and sometimes created by leaders. But at the same time, they're very important to the people who are members of that group. So you have both situations. You have people, as we can observe on a daily basis, dying because of their group membership or because they're wanting to attack another group. At the same time, of course, they're socially constructed distinctions. Examples of salient identities, they differ across the world. For example, in, in Africa, many, it's often a matter of ethnicity or clan. It's often a matter of religion. This is true in most regions of the world and currently very much so in, in the Middle East. In Nigeria, religion is important. In Northern Ireland, it can be a matter of race, as in Malaysia or Fiji or South Africa. It can be a matter of region. Uh, it can be a matter of caste. There are many different ways salient identities and they are fluid they change over time and you have to be, know a particular society to know which one is important at any one time and sometimes in conflict they sort of transmute from one thing to another they start by seeming to be primarily ethnic and then they turn into being primarily religious now the horizontal inequalities i'm talking about are multi-dimensional they're not just a question of income but all sorts of aspects that are visible to members and are felt as important and of course, which ones are most important will vary according to your society. But important dimensions are politics. Do you have political power? Does one group have political power, another one doesn't? Is one group excluded? Economic resources, land, employment, incomes. Uh, social resources such as education, health, networks. And then importantly, cultural recognition. Is your culture being given due respect? Is your language being allowed to be used, of course that has economic implications if, if it's not. Is your religion being given respect or is it banned and so on. So how do horizontal inequalities mobilize people for conflict? Well what they do essentially is combine identity and grievance. The identities I've talk talked about, 
But if a particular group has a big grievance, then that identity, it's very easy to mobilise behind that particular identity. And the grievance will reinforce the sense of the identity. Um, so ethnic or religious boundaries can be a very powerful source of mobilisation in general, but especially where there are blatant horizontal inequalities. And if one th divides people into the sort of leaders of a conflict and the people who do the fighting and then, then the people who support those who do the fighting, so leaders, followers, supporters, the leaders are particularly motivated by political inequalities because they are the people who potentially think they should have political power. The followers and the supporters are more likely to be motivated by socioeconomic inequalities, um, but they also care very much about political inequalities. But, of course, the, the leaders can very easily point to them and say, look, your land, you've got unequal land, you've got unequal unemployment, and so on and so forth. And so they become especially important for the followers and the supporters. Um, now, putting it like this doesn't mean that I'm excluding individual motivation altogether. That would be stupid. People always act partly for their group and partly for their individual uh, motivation. And I think what the individual motivation is very powerful in is determining who is actually going to come forward and fight. Who is going to be the people who are mobilised? Uh, well, the overall inequalities, the horizontal inequalities, are what causes the mobilisation in the first place. Now, there's quite a lot of evidence in support of this um, hypothesis. Uh, to start with, there are many case studies where it's clear that horizontal inequalities have played an important part. For example, in Côte d'Ivoire, Northern Ireland, Guatemala, today you could say Syria, and so on. But then there are also examples where horizontal inequalities are in existence, but conflict hasn't happened, so we've got to think about that situation too. Um, and that's one reason why people turn to econometric evidence, because econometric evidence looks both at the countries where there is conflict and the countries where there are, isn't. And there's been quite a lot of econometric evidence across countries by a whole series of different people, some in Africa, some globally, um, which produce uh, significant results, that where there's more horizontal inequalities, conflict's more likely. Um, there's also been within-country econo econometrics, for example, in Indonesia, the conflict, the place in which conflict takes place, or took place when, when there was conflict in the 1990s, was um, where the horizontal inequalities were bigger. Uh, there's been investigation into separatist violence, which shows the same thing. And there's also been investigation into perceptions of group injustice using the Afrobarometer perceptions and showing the same thing. Now, it's interesting that all this is found for horizontal inequalities, but econometrics does not find any significant results or systematic significant results for vertical inequality. And for a long reason, that was for a long time, that was the reason why people said, "Oh, grievances and, and inequality in particular is not behind conflict." It's because they were looking at the wrong type of inequality, and it, you can understand because vertical inequality, there's no identity to mobilise behind. Um, now, as I said, you do have cases where you have high horizontal inequalities and not conflict, and what you're finding is a probability, not a certainty. You're finding that the risk of conflict rises, not that it just fo the day follows night, so to speak. So we need to investigate when it happens and why. And some of the studies have suggested that. Um, one important finding is that it happens more often when there are both political and socio-economic inequalities in the same direction. If they go in opposite directions, one group has political power, one group has economic power, it's much less likely that you're going to have conflict. It's when both are, so, so to speak, disenfranchised. Uh, we have cases where you have, and we come back to the Ghana case, we have political inclusiveness in Ghana, despite the fact that we have big socio-economic inequalities, it hasn't uh, led to conflict. And there's the interesting case of Côte d'Ivoire, where for a long time there was political inclusiveness, but big socio-economic inequalities, and then uh, the political system after Houphouar Boigny died became very exclusive, and then conflict broke out. Um, I think this is worth noting that that's why the elections which had to happen this week in Nigeria are so critical, 
because there has been a convention that the South and then the North and then the South and then the North should have political power, and that has kept the country together. But now this is being challenged by the present president, and if he wins this election, I think this may be quite dangerous. Another reason why horizontal inequalities may turn to conflict is where you have high-value minerals, partly because they themselves feed directly into horizontal inequalities. There's one particular group that gets, uh, gets the resources, and of course they also feed into the private motivation of people. And a third um, issue is the strength of the state. If you have a strong state, you can suppress. You have you know, potential conflict, but it's suppressed. Um, and you could say that that was what was happening in the Middle East until recently. So if you have weak states, it's more likely that these things will lead to conflict. But we shouldn't, therefore, say, well, we should just have strong states, because strong states can sometimes initiate violence in the light of horizontal inequalities, worried that they may, in fact, face a rebellion, they sort of preempt it. And I think you find that the conflict in Sudan for many years um, just exactly exemplifies that situation. So let me then turn to policy. Um, despite the clear importance of keeping horizontal inequalities low, and I would say it's important for justice as well as for conflict, because there is no justice in having different groups, different racial groups, different genders, different ethnicities with unequal inequality, so apart, quite apart from conflict, but here we're talking about conflict. So given this importance, you would think it would form part of policy. It does to some extent get incorporated into conflict uh, development policy towards conflict states. It does not get incorporated, as far as I know, into development policy generally. But it should do, because every country in a way is a potential conflict country, and one should be trying to get uh, the situation in a stable and sustainable um, one right from the start. So what are the policy implications? Well, first of all, that you need to monitor the situation so that you know what's happening, monitor and measure. Secondly, there is a range of policies to correct inequalities which can be classified into direct and indirect. Direct ones are when you actually name a group. It's like affirmative action and give particular privileges to a group. Indirect policies are when you have a universal policy, for example, progressive taxation, but because the groups are unequal, that's going to help group inequality. So there's those types. And then you can have pre-distribution policies and redistribution. Pre-distribution are policies directed at incomes before people get them, so to speak. Um, so minimum wage is a pre-distribution policy or an employment policy could be a pre-distribution policy. Redistribution is that people have got the income, so you then take it away. Politically, it's more difficult to do that, so there's a lot to be said for looking for pre-distribution. There's been some highly successful cases of policy, so it's not impossible. But the difficult thing is to get the political conditions. But in Malaysia, for example, they introduced policies in 1970, and between 1970 and 2010, that's a long period, of course, the difference between Malays and Chinese income was two and a half times in, in 1970, and now it's about 1.4. So there's been a big narrowing of the gap, and the same is true of education and other aspects. The other case which is interesting is Northern Ireland, um, where on our doorstep inequalities were very high, um, huge. And then from 1970 there were a lot of policies which reduced them radically. So whereas the Catholic unemployment rate, for example, was 18% above the Protestant in 1980, 20 years later it was only 5% difference, and we got the peace process. So I think it was very, very important. So let me conclude. Where horizontal inequalities are large, it's important to address them because they significantly raise the risk of conflict, especially if there's both political and socioeconomic inequalities. There's a range of policies available both economic and political, which can be effective without the sacrifice of efficiency, and mostly have had peace-promoting political consequences. But I would emphasize that sensitivity is needed in policies. Any policy in a conflict-prone country must be done sensitively. And of course, while some gain, some poor groups gain, rich groups lose. So uh, sensitivity is absolutely critical. And finally, uh, monitoring is very important.
I've said all this, but I'm not saying every other reason for conflict is wrong. This is one of the main, an important reason. We should also look at the other reasons. Thank you.